My dear friends, good day. You probably all know Alexander the Great, the King of Macedonia. He is probably one of the greatest figures of antiquity and history. You probably know that he had one of the greatest empires in the world. And I myself have talked about Alexander a few times in videos, like the one where I talk about the siege of the city of Tyre. An absolutely incredible war story when you think about it, since Alexander will decide to storm nothing less than an island, but by land, turning it into a peninsula. Pretty crazy. What we don't talk about as much when we talk about Alexander is what happens next. Alexander. What happened when he died? What legacy did he leave behind? Let's find out together. So here it is. Alexander is dead. King at 19 of Macedonia, a kingdom in northern Greece. Alexander, the third, known as the Great, conquered half the world in less than a decade in a dazzling epic. But in Babylon, on June 13, 323 BC, he died at the age of 32. Stunned by fever, he dies in a few days, without saying a word and without leaving any heir or will. However, a tradition reports that Alexander would have said to his chancellor in his last breath that he wanted his empire to return to the best. This is what fuels an endless struggle between his potential successors, who covet the infinite wealth of this empire that stretches from Greece to the border of India. There are two legitimate heirs who could ascend the throne, but unfortunately they are both unfit to rule. The first one is a son of Philip of Macedonia, who is also named Philip, so he is Alexander's half-brother but unfortunately he is suffering from a mental illness that will disqualify him for the position. The second heir, he is also unfit, but for him it's because he is in fact a fetus. Yes, it is the unborn child of Alexander and his wife, Roxanne. While waiting for his delivery, we don't know if the deceased king will have a male heir. The legal vagueness of the situation opens the door to all personal ambitions. Indeed, in Macedonia the rule of succession of the kingdom is not well fixed at this time. Theoretically, it is an assembly of free men which must elect the new king, in the family of the Argiades, the family of Alexander. Now, one can quite easily integrate a family by a game of marriage and alliances, which stirs up a lot of envy. In Babylon, in June 323, in front of the king's remains, we have two teams facing each other. The first one wants to wait for the birth of the heir, hoping that it will be a boy. The second one wants to acclaim Philip III, the half-brother. In both cases, it is a godsend for the ambitious, because the future heir will be weak and easily manipulated. One is mentally deficient, and the other, once born, will have to wait for his majority to reign. In the army, the infantry supports Alexander's half-brother, Philip, while the cavalry declares itself in favor of the first wife, Roxanne, and her unborn child. A compromise is nevertheless found between the partisans of the two solutions, and at the birth of the son of Alexander and Roxanne, he takes the name of Alexander IV, and a co-royalty is established. The symbolic question is thus settled, since we have found a legitimate king, even two, to replace Alexander. But this episode still shows the internal tensions in the army and its generals on the conduct to adopt. And then, the hardest thing is still to be done. It is necessary to decide concretely on the organization of the power which the two sovereigns are unable to exert. Alexander's generals then divide the regions of the empire to become satraps, that is to say governors, under the authority of Perdikas, who, as the most senior general, acts as regent and guarantor of the Argead dynasty. In the summer of 323, things seem to be getting better. The empire has two legitimate rulers, a regent respected by all and governors who swear loyalty to them. But of course, this rule is never respected and as soon as they arrive in their respective satrapies, these generals, that historians call the diadochs, that is to say, the successors, fight each other. In fact, instead of the satrapies, we have real independent kingdoms. The first division of the empire, known as the Babylonian Agreements, concerns about 25 generals who all get a share of this huge cake. But to avoid complicating things, and you'll see it's already complicated enough as it is, we can content ourselves with the main ones, especially since barely two years later a new division is made because some of them are already dead. In short, Perdikas is therefore established in Babylon, the capital chosen by Alexander, and he acts as regent. Kratoros, one of the most respected generals, becomes tutor of the kings, a kind of co-regent. Ptolemy, faithful among the faithful, obtains Egypt. Seleucus manages to impose himself in Persia. Antipatros governs Macedonia, 
the native country. Antigone, that is, the one-eyed, becomes satrapy of Asia Minor. Lysimachus obtains Thrace, and finally Eumenes, Cappadocia. So we have two rulers and eight main diadochs, to make it simple. Now, I have a question to ask you. Are you ready for the game of massacre? The rest of the story is indeed a constant struggle between all the successors to try to monopolize the empire. These men have spent years together traveling the world. They have fought and served their kings side by side. They know each other intimately. And yet, they will spend the rest of their lives plotting against each other or openly warring. This is the story of veteran generals with great ambitions, not to say excessive egos, and who up to 80 years old for some of them, will continue to fight for Alexander's legacy four decades after his death. It must be said that the empire was particularly fragile. Born from a lightning conquest, it might disappear as quickly. The empire existed only through the person of its young king, Alexander. These territories, too distant and too different, could not remain united without the fiction of a demigod monarch who called himself the son of Zeus. In 323, the news of Alexander's death spreads immediately in the whole empire, and the risk of splitting up appears right away. In Greece, the cities dream of a new independence and revolt. It is what one calls the Lamiak War. The Athenians in particular lead the insurrection. At first victorious, they are defeated on land and sea in 322 by the Macedonians. As a punishment, Antipatros, governor in Greece, suppresses democracy in Athens. At the same time, on the other side of the empire, more than 3,500 kilometers away, the Greeks of Bactria in Central Asia rise up, but they are harshly repressed by Perdikas. The Diadochs are still trying to maintain the unity of the empire. And I say they try because from 321, things escalate in a rather dirty way. Perdikas, regent and therefore the most important character of the empire, loses the confidence of the other Diadochs because his power takes a more and more authoritarian turn. And that is completely unbearable in the eyes of his former comrades in arms, who, although younger, were generals like him in the Macedonian army. Perdikas indeed dared to disown Krateros, the co-regent who returned to Europe without his consent. He also married Cleopatra, daughter of Olympias, and therefore half-sister of Alexander, which gives him a considerable argument to claim the imperial throne. However, in this struggle of each one against all, as soon as one becomes too powerful, one is exposed to reprisals. The other diadochs refuse to lose the game so quickly and join forces against Perdikas. The latter is only supported by Eumenes, who is completely dependent on this protector, while Krateros, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, Antipatros, and Antigone form an alliance. They all say they are defending the interests of the empire, but in reality, each one finds an opportunity to enlarge or strengthen his positions. Antigone, for example, sees there is a means of recovering from Eumenes Cappadocia, which is close to his own satrapy. Faced with the coalition of other diadochs, Perdikas sends Eumenes to the strait separating Asia and Europe to prevent the passage of the armies of Lysimachus and Antipatros. But this plan is a failure, and the army of Macedonia manages to pass into Asia, probably partly thanks to a betrayal of the commander of the army of Eumenes, who has to withdraw in Cappadocia. Meanwhile, Perdikas, the regent of the empire, leads an expedition against Ptolemy's Egypt. However, his soldiers disapprove of this enterprise, and, probably inspired by infiltrated enemies, an assembly of the army dismisses Perdikas and condemns him to death. His army turns on him, and he is executed in May 321. This episode shows us the extent of the opposition in the ranks of the soldiers, and in particular from the Silver Shields. These are veterans, most of them about 60 years old, who have participated in all of Alexander's conquests without ever being defeated. Guys who have quite a bit of prestige and can influence the rest of the troops, since soldiers are indeed free men used to giving their opinion and voting. In the logic of things, a general should therefore get their consent, which Perdikas neglected to do anyway. But the execution of Perdikas by his soldiers will also reveal a profound change in the recruitment of armies, since they become largely made up of mercenaries, whose only loyalty is money. They are therefore very easy to turn around, as soon as they are promised better pay, which the generals of the opposite camp had well understood. In 321, enough with Perdikas, the empire does not have any more regent. At the same time, Eumenes, who stayed in Asia, 
pushes back the army of Kratoros, who is killed, and manages to save his own skin. The deaths of Perdikas and Kratoros lead the other Diadochs to redivide the Empire, while ousting Eumenes, the only one left in the losing camp. This new sharing takes place at Triparadisos in 321. Antigone is thus appointed strategist of all Asia Minor, with a mission to capture and execute Eumenes. Antipatros, the governor of Macedonia, is the new dean of the Companions of Alexander. He thus receives the title of regent in the place of Perdikas and becomes the tutor of the kings, who are transferred from Babylonia to Macedonia in 319. But that same year, Antipatros dies and leaves Macedonia to his son Cassander, who also served in the army of Alexander. You see, I told you it was going to get complicated. Antigone the One-Eyed, who has been given the task of capturing the renegade Eumenes by this new division, immediately sets out to accomplish his mission. He launches himself against him in Cappadocia, dislodges him, and then chases him to Persia, and finally eliminates him in 316. But in Persia, Antigone surprises himself to dream of a little more. He uses his advantage to chase Seleucus out of Babylon and quickly dominates most of Alexander's empire. It is without counting on Ptolemy in Egypt, Lysimachus in Thrace, and Cassander in Macedonia, who still resist him. His rivals thus join together against Antigone, who cannot fight on all the fronts. Once again, the Diadochs ally themselves against one of them, who threatens to become too powerful and to take the upper hand for good. Between 315 and 311, war rages on all sides, but no one manages to prevail. Ptolemy's troops patiently push back those of Antigone, and Seleucus can return to Babylon in 311 and reconquer the Persian cities. His power over Persia and Mesopotamia is re-established, and a status quo is established in 311 between Antigone and Ptolemy, Lysimachus, and Cassandra. But a little subtlety, the territories of Seleucus are not concerned by this agreement, and taking advantage of this separate peace with three of his four opponents, Antigone launches himself against the Persia of Seleucus, a real social traitor. The two Diadochs enter a fierce war in Mesopotamia between 311 and 309. Antigone ravages the country to weaken his enemy, and it is not until August 10, 309, that the two men finally face each other in a pitched battle. Antigone is defeated and has to withdraw permanently from Mesopotamia. Seven years of war for nothing. Not bad, especially since the hostilities resume the following year, in 308, without bringing any decisive outcome. The only change that one can note is that the Diadochs, one after the other, proclaim themselves kings to support their legitimacy to govern. And to support their approach, they don't do anything. In Macedonia, Cassander had Alexander's son assassinated in 310, just before his majority, which was 14 years old at the time. Philip, the other ruler, had been suppressed seven years earlier. So there is no longer any reason to formalize what already existed that is, independent kingdoms built on the ashes of Alexander's empire. Time passes, men age, and wars follow one another. A last coalition definitively destroys the forces of Antigone the One-Eyed, who is killed in Asia Minor at the Battle of Ipsus in 301. The guy who is still at the head of his army? He was 80 years old. The victorious Diadochs, there are only four of them left, share his possessions in Asia Minor except for some cities that his son Demetrius still controls. This date marks a pause in the wars that have ravaged the empire for over 20 years, and from this moment on, the Diadoc kings will agree to coexist peacefully. At least, in theory. They understand that trying to rebuild the empire is illusory and destructive, and it's better to concentrate on the huge territories already acquired rather than to risk everything. Besides, the fact that the Argean dynasty is gone for good it has totally removed the fiction of the reunification of the empire. Everyone knows that is now impossible. And after all, ruling Persia or Egypt is not so bad. However, war resurfaces through Demetrius, the son of Antigone the One-Eyed, who has not said his last word. He keeps an important army in Asia Minor and takes advantage of the death of the king of Macedonia, Cassander, in 297 to land in Greece and seize Athens after a long siege. He then went against the heart of Macedonia, further north, but had to retreat. The neighbors of Macedonia, Lysimachus, who still holds Thrace in the east, and Pyrrhus, the king of Epirus in the west, who is not a diadoch, then throw themselves on Macedonia to share it. But Pyrrhus becomes a threat when he proclaims himself king of Macedonia and claims Alexander's heritage in 288. 
the Diadochs refuse to recognize Pyrrhus, this foreigner who has never participated in Alexander's conquests, and so they join forces against him. Pyrrhus is quickly defeated in favor of Lysimachus, who then extends in Macedonia and reigns on all the circumference of the Aegean Sea and on a large part of Asia Minor in the second half of the years 280. He becomes, at 75 years old, the new strongman of the three Diadochs still alive. Still alive, still standing, as Renault would say. The guy's indestructible, but an act of madness will precipitate his fall. He murders his own son and heir to give preference to the son of his second marriage. His first wife then seeks refuge with Seleucus in Mesopotamia and pushes him to attack her ex-husband. It's getting a little bit complicated. So the War of the Old Men starts again, for the last time. Seleucus, who reigns over a huge territory, gathers a formidable army and marches towards the west. He faces Lysimachus in 281, who dies on the battlefield of Kurupedion, near the city of Sardis in Asia Minor. Enthusiastic about his success, Seleucus continues in Europe to seize the crown of Macedonia. He still dreams, at 77 years old, to claim all the empire of Alexander. Unfortunately, he is assassinated in 280 on the shores of Thrace by the son of Ptolemy, who proclaims himself king of Macedonia. He was the last diadoc alive, since Ptolemy died in Egypt two years earlier, at the age of 85. It is the end of 40 years of fratricidal war between former comrades in arms. So, after this murderous story, which will have shown us that Alexander's generals were more overflowing with personal ambitions than loyalty, what is left? Well, we can see that some Diadoc kingdoms managed to maintain themselves over time. The two great groups that are Lagid Egypt, the dynasty of Ptolemy, and Seleucid Persia, the dynasty of Seleucus, last for several centuries. On the other hand, Macedonia is quickly prey to anarchy, having to face invasions of Celtic peoples, which come to add to the political and military confusion. The two great kingdoms which survived the death of the Diadochs are in fact very old political constructions, and the Diadochs, just like Alexander before them, had only had to rely on administrations that were already in place and firmly anchored. Egypt and Persia had scribes, tax collectors, irrigated and very productive countrysides, roads, developed urban centers, and strong identities that ensured an important cohesion to these countries. Lagid and Seleucid kingdoms therefore adopted local customs and did not invent much, just prolonged the management of these states, much older than the Macedonian conquest. In Egypt, the Greek Lagid dynasty, for example, proceeded to merge Greek and Egyptian religions, while ending a cult of the royal family to unify the lands under their possession. The kings and queens descended from Ptolemy thus become living deities, in the manner of the pharaohs whose title they take over, and they remain symbolically linked to Alexander thanks to the possession of the remains that Ptolemy had managed to bring back to Egypt. However, after the death of the Diadochs, these two great groups do not always coexist peacefully. Throughout the 3rd century BCE, Lagids and Seleucids regularly went to war with each other for control of Syria, which constituted their common border. Ptolemy III, who reigned from 246 to 222 BCE, was engaged early in his reign in a war against the Seleucid Empire for control of Syria. The Egyptian troops go down the Euphrates and reach Babylon, but without succeeding in bringing down the citadel. A few years later, it was the turn of the Seleucids to push far into the heart of the Lagid Kingdom, and Antiochus IV, the Seleucid king, temporarily seized the Nile Delta before having to withdraw. The incessant quarrels between successors finally show us the fragility of the immense empire of Alexander the Great, which rested only on his person. It was a shaky construction that was held together by everyone's fascination with the living myth that Alexander represented. The result, a few decades later, is that only small kingdoms remain, or powers consolidated around large regions that already had their own coherence, in particular, Persia and Egypt. None of the Diadochs will have been able to do as well as their illustrious predecessor to become the best. In any case, it shows us that during antiquity, one could already live very well until 75 or 80 years old, and that allows us to smash another cliché in the process, which is not bad. Thank you all for following this episode prepared with Luca Pacot. Feel free to support our work on YouTube by subscribing, sharing the episode, or joining us on other networks, like Instagram, for example, where we offer other formats that are not here. See you soon on Nota Bene. Bye.